Hey everyone, welcome to End of Life University podcast where we share real talk about life and death. I'm your host, Dr. Karen Wyatt, and I'm glad you're here with me today. It's episode number 313. I'll be sharing with you an interview I did today with Reed Peterson, who is the creator of a smartphone app called Grief Refuge, and we're going to be talking all about technology and how this app works. And I'm really excited about it. So I'm eager to share that with you and hoping that you might want to download the app and check it out for yourself. But before we get to that, just a couple of announcements. I am going to be teaching a workshop on surviving the aftermath of suicide on September 9th from 1 to 3 p.m. Pacific. It will be online using Zoom. And I'll leave a link where you can register for it. The ticket price is $20 just for this two-hour workshop. So I hope you'll join me if that's something you feel would be useful to you. I've designed it partly for people who have experienced suicide in their lives or had it touch their lives, but also for those of you working as death doulas with people at the end of life because you might be called upon to help a family that's dealing with suicide. And I think this could be perhaps give you a few tools to work with and help you with your own understanding and your comfort level in working with people who have experienced suicide. So once again, September 9th from 1 to 3 p.m. Pacific time, and there will be a link to register for that in the show notes for this episode at eolupodcast.com and look for episode number 313 and you'll see it there. Also, just a reminder that I have a page on Patreon where you can sign up to make small donations to keep this podcast on the air. That page is Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash E-O-L-U. And it's now possible to make an annual donation if rather than making um, 12 monthly donations a year, you'd like to just donate one time up front, you can do that. And you'll get a 16% discount by donating for the whole year at one time instead of donating per month. So that's an option that just now became available on Patreon. And uh, just a reminder, the bo- I, I offer bonuses for every tier of the, the, uh, the of support that you offer, but everyone who joins our Patreon team receives once a month the end of life news update where I curate news articles around this end of life arena f- and share them with you. And also from time to time, movie reviews done by my husband and me called Two Doctors and a Movie, and we take a look at movies that deal with death and dying and grief and give you our opinions for whatever they're worth about those movies. So uh, join the team and take advantage of those bonuses I have for you. And now we'll move on to my interview with Reed Peterson. And as always, I'll be back after the interview with a few takeaways and to say goodbye. So here we go. Today, I'm happy to welcome my guest, Reed Peterson. Reed is the creator of the Grief Refuge website, which provides tools, resources, and support to help navigate grief's lonely journey, and also the Grief Refuge mobile app that provides daily support to people in grief. And I'm going to let Reed tell us his story and how he ended up creating the website and the app, Grief Refuge. So, uh, That's enough of my introduction there, but you can find more about Reed and his work at the website griefrefuge.com. Also, uh, go to Grief Refuge app on Instagram or Grief Refuge on Facebook. So, Reed, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, Karen, actually, I want to thank you because I deeply respect the work that you do. I respect the conversations that you host. And so, thank you. This is a truly an honor for me to be here talking to you. 
Oh, well, thank thank you for saying that. I'm so excited to talk with you because uh, because of the fact that you've created a mobile app around grief, and I can't wait to get into that discussion about the app and how it works. But I was hoping you would start by just telling us a little bit of your backstory and what led to you creating Grief Refuge. Yeah, happy to. So it's a little bit of a back to the future story. If we remember Michael J. Fox back in the 80s, mm-hmm. what had happened was uh, in 2006, I was in graduate school and I was looking to study psychology and I wanted to be a professor of transpersonal psychology, which was um, studying transformation and, and how uh, you know getting to the mountaintop could act, be accessed <laughs> quicker <laughs> than normal. <laughs> and... Um, but my, my dad died in 2006, and he, um, it was a sad, actually a sad death. He took his life, and he, um, he was, suffered from alcoholism, and he suffered from post-traumatic stress. And it's an unusual story because when he would drink, he would binge drink, and it was you know, pretty ugly. He, and he'd get really, really intoxicated. And, and to this day, 15 years later, I still don't know exactly what happened, but on the death certificate, it says that he died from a subdural hematoma, which means that he severed his cervical spine. And the way it happened was he was in his house and he was absolutely alone. So the narrative I hold in my mind is that he experienced a flashback. He served in the Vietnam War and he did suffer from flashbacks. And I assume, I assume that he bull charged his wall and he hit the top of his head against the wall and severed his cervical spine and ended up uh, dying from that accident. But I also share, as you heard, I also share the story that he did take his life because that was a choice that he made. And uh, when he died, I had actually a, a tremendous amount of relief uh, because most of my adult life, I perceived my dad as someone who really suffered. Uh, he suffered with his, his mental health challenges. He suffered with relating to people. He suffered with like being a fit in society, so to speak. And all that relief um, somehow dramatically changed when five years later, or excuse me, 10 years later, it was five years ago at the time of this recording, 10 years later, my stepfather Warren died. Now Warren was an active father figure in my life and I lived with my mom and, and Warren growing up. And when he initially died, I thought, okay, you know, I've kind of been here before. My dad died 10 years earlier. Um, I'm going to have my grief experience. But it was very surprising, Karen. It was completely the opposite of what I would expect. Um, I felt tremendously lonely. And, uh, you know, the sorrow was really, really deep and very emotionally painful. And I just spent a lot of time alone in nature just pondering and reflecting and contemplating and and also missing Warren but as I was going through that type of grief experience I was also recognizing that a lot of feelings were coming up um, in regards to my my dad dying 10 years earlier and me recognizing that I had a lot of unprocessed grief and it's interesting because when my dad died I didn't necessarily feel denial or I wouldn't look back at it now and say I was denying my feelings. I, I, it was authentic. I really felt like, um, a lot of relief and, and almost like joy that he was in a place, but, um, coming more to the present time times, I'm, I'm also evaluating like the type of relationship that we had and, and hope and re thinking about, 
how I wished our relationship would have been so different at the time that he was living. So now, now we wrap this all into a term called complicated grief. <laughs> and so, and so, you know, when Warren died and I'm now looking at physical deaths of two father figures and then another, um, another type of loss related to the type of relationship with my dad that I never had, I did seek out community support uh, where I live and I did work with uh, a group or I did join a support group and I also did work with a bereavement counselor and had great experiences. But what I found was as I delved a bit deeper into my emotional process uh, in let's say I met with uh, my group or my therapist on a Wednesday I, on Thursday evening, I would feel like, you know, perhaps some wound, some wounds were opened as a metaphor. And in that emotional feeling, I would say, well, what do I do with this? Because I'm not going to be meeting with either my support group or my, the therapist I'm working with for almost another week. And so at the time, my option was, well, I guess I could journal, I guess I could write things down, which, yes, is a tremendously helpful and healthy option. But that got me thinking about, well, what, what could be available to people in grief who feel like they need a bit more support? So it's a long answer to your question, Karen, but that's how the idea and uh, the seed got planted for creating the Gr Grief Refuge app so that there could be support provided on a daily basis. Hmm. Thank you for sharing your story, Reed, and I really resonate with it. And, and I don't know if you know anything about my history, but my father died now 32 years ago um, by suicide as, as well. He took his life. So I have experienced that complicated grief of um, ongoing for years and years over my father's death as well. So I understand what you're talking about there. And also the fact that every death we experience, it, grief can be somewhat different and we have different needs with every death and how unique that is. And it kind of makes sense why any one approach to grief or one counselor's theories about grief may not be enough for for any of us as, as we experience these varied varied types of grief in our own lives. That's so well said, Karen. I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you. Well, I remember back, um, particularly, well, after my father died and then more recently when my mother died, what I remember the most is having sleepless nights, lying awake in bed, not able to go to sleep, knowing I'm probably awake because I need to process my grief now. And as you said, there's no support group available for me. There's no therapist here for me to talk to. I'm just alone right now. And as I, I downloaded your app, which I love, and I thought, wow, how amazing would that have been in the middle of the night, if I could have um, gotten my phone and just opened the app and found this not only support, but tools and resources and guidance there in the middle of the night that, you know, might have helped me do a better job of processing the grief I was working on. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I'm going to challenge you on that, do a better job, <laughs> because um, <laughs> uh, as, as somebody who's learned to be a grief companion, I, I don't think there's right or wrong in doing our grief. I just think there's um, leaning into it, attention, and, and also taking breaks from it. <laughs> yeah, well, that you're right. You're exactly right. That wasn't a good choice of words <laughs> on, on my part, because you're right, we're always doing the best we can with whatever we have available to us in the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to get into the app in order to describe it for people who are listening, um, because I'm just really amazed by it. I, it's really beautiful, for one thing, and I just I want to be able to tell people about what it consists of uh, for people, especially who might never have thought of this idea of actually having an app on their phone that helps them with grief. So could we go over some of the features of the app? We can, yeah. Where would you like to start? 
I, if it's okay, I would like to just respond to what you've experienced because if because if you just say read, share, you know, tell us about the app, I'm probably going to sound a little bit too technical, and I just want to refrain from that. Okay. All right. Well, one of the first things that that stood out to me, I'll just start <laughs> randomly, but was the fact that there's a journaling component on the app. Because for me, um, I'm I'm a big fan of journaling anyway. But journaling and writing about my feelings and my thoughts and my experiences, uh, for me, I found to be one of the most helpful things I could do during my my times of deep grieving and um, even having those journal entries that I could go back and read later and I could also kind of measure changes and things I've learned and so I was really happy to see that there is a journaling component on the app so maybe you could just t- tell people how that works. Yeah, a lot of journals um, in grief support have a lot of prompts. And I think that's a really good thing because I believe that grief can overwhelm. So the simpler, the better. So like if I am a griever and it says, um, you know, whatever the question is, it's some open-ended question and it gives me an idea or something to grasp to write about. I think that's very healthy, but what I, what I set up the feature of the journal in my grief refuge is slightly different. Instead of asking specific prompting questions, I provided categories of different emotional experiences. So for example, sadness or overwhelm. And so when someone who's using the app goes to the journal feature, they can choose what emotion is kind of best fit for their current experience. And then that opens up the the note-taking portion of it so that they can document perhaps what they're experiencing and then have it as a, re- well, I was going to say resource, but that might not be the best word, just has it a, have, have it as reference to reflect upon sometime in the future should they feel that desire to. And it's interesting because then it, it, in a way helps to categorize some of the entries in the journal so that, for example, if you were writing about anger or something, times you felt angry, you would be able to go back and look through other times you felt that same emotion and what you might have written about. And that seems like a really good way to mark, as I said, mark the changes that are happening. But I remember with all of my journals that I have that are just chronological, I often have to scroll through and try to find like, oh, where was it that I wrote? I I wrote something a few weeks ago, just like I felt the same way. And I wrote something and I'm scrolling through to try to find it. But that seems to me to be really helpful that um, there's a way of categorizing those entries. Yeah, thanks for saying that. I yeah, I guess it was more set up so where when someone wants to look back at where they they where they were to where they are now on their grief journey, they may say like, oh, "Okay, I can recognize the different perspectives." And that really helps, I believe, with the psyche and the emotional processing of grief because as I said earlier, it, it can just be such an overwhelming process. Yeah, I th- I think that would be really helpful because I remember um, one year out in my grief process, uh, some part of, of me had believed that a year after my father's death, I was suddenly going to f- feel much better. And I remember feeling really frustrated that I didn't feel much better, but but. I later came to recognize I I couldn't see what changes had occurred during that year at the time. And I, it might've been nice to, to have a better way of just observing that and witnessing for myself, um, what was happening during that year. It wasn't that I was staying in one place. Changes had been happening during that year, but I wasn't able to see them. Mm. It's so interesting. I wonder if it was, what do you think prompted that one-year expectation? 
Well, I suppose part of it as a doctor, some of my medical training you know, which was very brief uh, and didn't, not comprehensive at all. And I, and not really helpful. I realize now about dealing with grief, but kind of the expectation that grief for most things should, 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 should run its course in about six months, you know, having been taught that in my training and then thinking, well, for a suicide death, we could probably allow another six months and maybe by a year I'll feel better. And part of it was probably my denial in a way too. And, um, just hoping that the pain I felt would, would come to an end, you know, and, and imagining it could have, that could happen within a year. But of course that was, completely unrealistic and not how grief works, which, which I needed to learn for myself. So, Hmm. well, it sounds very normal. Uh, Almost everybody I talk to has similar expectations upon themselves. Well, I know in the app, um, I believe it says that journal entries are totally private. So no one else can, um, can read your journal entries on your phone if that's of comfort to some people. Cause I remember feeling that everything I'm writing here is so personal and so intimate. I would never want it to be shared with anyone else. Yeah, that, that is a 150% true statement. Even, you know, developers who help me put this app together, they, nobody has access to that. Just, just the person who's creating them. And then another um, another aspect of the app that I really liked were uh, reflections, if you would talk about that. Yeah, so I love stories. Um, and I just felt it, and I know that in, in the grief process, it's very helpful to obviously tell your story but it's also helpful to hear stories from others. Sometimes people just want to listen. So the reflections feature is a collaboration of stories and they have, they're very different stories, very different type of losses, but thematically they have a similarity where it's told from someone who would identify as being more more into what it, what I call reconciliation, being able to understand their loss, um, connect it to their current physical reality, and honor the memory of their loved one. And so, with that said, I hold this perspective that they're kind of healing stories, in essence. I, I love that idea because I do remember in the midst of my grief, um, many times I felt so alone and I looked around at um, my friends and co-workers and the people I saw every day and I I realized like they have no idea what I'm experiencing right now and I don't even know how to tell them what this is like. And I could imagine that being able to listen to stories of other grievers would be very comforting and to feel like, oh, I'm not so strange. <laughs> this is something other people have gone through, even though the people in my, in my immediate presence are not experiencing it. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's exactly it. You know, if it's okay, I'd like to share a secret with you and your listeners, Karen. <laughs> yes, please do. So at the time of us recording this, Grief Refuge as an app is very young. It's only been available for, I think, three or three and a half months. Um, And fortunately, a lot of people are receiving it very well. And that touches my heart to know, to be able to provide something. But the secret I want to share is that the reflection stories, there's a hope that as people use the app more, they're able to submit their story to be added to the app. So as they experience healing and reconciliation in their own grief process, maybe they move on and they say, okay, I no longer need to use grief refuge on a consistent basis, but then I hope that we can um, 
receive a story from them as far as uh, learning more about their loss and their healing process. So the secret's out now. <laughs> mm, that's beautiful. And it really comes full circle uh, to be able at some point down the road to give back to other people and to know that your story might bring bring comfort and healing to someone else. Exactly. And along the same lines, you also have a podcast uh, can, within the app as well that, that people can listen to. So uh, tell us what the podcast is about. Well, the podcast is produced uh, twice a month, um, not, not, not as much as your beautiful podcast. <laughs> I commend you for your ability to uh, produce an episode once a week. That's amazing. But um, uh, in the podcast episodes, we have um, one is more of, I guess, some form of guidance, some things to be aware of, um, general guidance in the grief process. So they help, they help people understand their process on a deeper level. And then other podcasts are interviews with amazing people doing amazing work, such as yourself. We're going to have to... We're going to have to ask you to be a guest on Grief Refuge Podcast. That would be great. And then I noticed you also have a feature called Ask the Author, where you um, feature books about grief and then interview the authors of the books. And that's that's really innovative and unique. I haven't seen anything like that before. Yeah, I am, I'm actually really excited about that because... As I mentioned, story and narrative is so important to me. So in these interviews, which are video, um, they're, they're, it's an opportunity to better understand the reason why someone wrote the book they wrote. You know, when we pick up a book at a bookstore, if we look at it on Amazon.com and, you know, we can view a few pages, we hear a lot of the marketing language. And then, you know, we can read a bit of the introduction and, get a get a sense for if we're going to resonate with you know how how this message is communicated well i i really wanted to do ask the author to have the opportunity to hear some of their own personal story um and, and then also even the process of writing the book because we you know similar to our our grief journeys all being unique we all have a unique writing process too. So I just think it's fun and helpful. And, and it, I think it can help a, a user of the app better determine if the book is going to be a good resource or helpful tool for them to read. That That's a great idea. And uh, I can't think of a better way to help someone find out if they're going to resonate with what the author has to share than filming those videos. So uh, the other, let's see, the other thing I wanted to mention, you have uh, intentions as a, f a feature on the app. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, intentions are almost like step-by-step uh, -step guidance for when you need. Sometimes we experience some what I call grief bursts or really hit hard by waves of grief. And it, it it's painful because here you are, you, you think you're doing great and you're like, okay, I'm starting to feel like a sense of normalcy. You know, I, I can get out of the house at an, a decent time or I can, you know, if I have a task list for the day, I'm able to check off many of these tasks. But then one day it's like, oh, bam, a, a whirlwind of grief has just swept me off my feet and I'm, you know, I feel like I'm starting over. That's kind of a, a common response I hear from people who experience a lot of uh, grief bursts or waves of grief. And the intentions are there to help address those type of needs where if you have a specific challenge, like here's some very specific guidance to, to get to. And so we often hear, well, you know, well meditation can help. But like, what about how to set boundaries when you're grieving? Because boundaries are very necessary. A lot of people 
really struggle with someone else trying to take over their grief. So setting boundaries can have help. And, and that's one of the intentions. I think there's eight, eight on there now. Hmm. Yeah, yes. And those seem very helpful to me as well. I, I was remembering one of those triggering events after my dad died that um, we were, we were going camping or something and needed to borrow an ice chest from my mom. And she told me, Oh, it's, it's out in the shed in the back if you want to go get it. And I, opened the door of the shed and it was full of my dad's hunting gear because he was a big hunter and I saw his sleeping bags and his tent and uh, everything and it it smelled like old spice which my dad wore all the time and a little bit like cigar smoke and I mean I just everything seeing all those items of my dad's and then the the smell of just my dad and his, you know, his hunting trips. And it it was just absolutely overwhelming. I just became, I completely froze in that moment. I was just paralyzed with the grief that came over me. And so, and it was just momentary, but I understand what you mean. There are times when it could be helpful to have something. In some ways, I almost wanted to I wanted to pay attention to that moment. I wanted to mark it because it was Mm -hmm. such an experience of the presence of my dad that I didn't want to lose it, even though it triggered all of my grief feelings. There was something really beautiful, too, in that moment. And so um, I I like the idea of just being able to make note of it, just being able to mark it and to have something to to read to almost make that moment sacred and honor it for just a bit before I moved on with the ice chest and packed up to go camping. Right. That's a beautiful example of a time. And it does sound, it does sound like such a beautiful experience. It almost sounds like it is is with your dad being physically dead. It could have been the closest you could get to him with seeing all of his possessions and, um, the sensory odors, like, wow, I'm deeply touched by that story. Yeah, it's it's such an interesting process, isn't it? Grief, uh, just such a tapestry, I guess, of the sadness, but then sometimes the preciousness even of our sadness, mm-hmm. you know, the, um, the preciousness of our loss and just the deep feelings of love that come up to the surface as we're missing the person who has died and um it it's very it's it's just a very rich experience in general and i think that's why i guess i wanted to be able to remember it yeah it, to me it sounds deeply meaningful well um all of the these features we've mentioned from the app i know these are all free right you can download the app for free and these features are all available at no charge is that correct That is correct yes you nailed it <laughs> Um but and so just for any listeners who aren't sure let's tell them how to download an app and how they could how they can get grief refuge on their phone Oh sure Let's see, the easiest way kind of I can explain it is if you uh, look on your phone and you find find your phone's app store and then you open that up and then there should be a little search icon, select that, and then you can type in uh, Grief Refuge and then that will show you the app and then I think you just tap the download button next to it and that'll get the app on your phone. Yeah, it's so simple. And I actually got it on my phone by going to griefrefuge.com to the website because you have a button there for downloading the app too, which just helped me get right to the app store um, to download it. So that that was very, it's very simple and easy to download. That is great to hear. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's, our, uh, that's our intention to make it simple. Yeah. And then, um, but then I really, I want to get into, you have um, also the possibility of a subscription for people who want to go a little bit deeper with the app. So would you uh, tell us what that consists of? 
Yes, uh, there are some features available on the app that do require a subscription. Currently, it's a, an $11.99 a month subscription, and I know that that's a lot for an app. However, I will say when subscribing to the app, you actually get support on a daily basis, and that's a true statement. Rain or shine, holiday or not, there is something new shared to your phone every single day. And this is what's called the daily refuge. And the daily refuge is what I like to call an audio musing. And it's a voice narrated with background sound, somewhat meditative, but somewhat um, personal uh, reflection about aspects of grief. Something to really just feel validated for the way you feel. And I've gotten so much feedback that it's deeply supportive. It's so helpful. Um, so many people have said, oh my gosh, thank you for saying what was said on today's Daily Refuge. I just don't hear things like that from the people in, in my family or in my community of support. And that's exactly why it was built to help provide that source of comfort to help people feel soothed and to just help them know that what they're doing is right for them. And it will, and then these messages help them cope with loss. And so the messages come every single morning. Is that right? Without fail? They, they do. Yes. If you're in the United States, um, they, it depends on your time zone, of course. And so, uh, they're set up to be in the morning. Um, uh, they're scheduled to come out about uh, 10.30 a.m. Eastern time every day. And so I know for people on the other side of the world, that may be some random times, or even if you're in Hawaii, that's a very early time. Um, however, our technology is built in a way where it can only be um, – one specific time frame. <laughs> it's something that we're working on to further develop so that the user can choose what time it, it wants. They want to receive the message, but, um, but we're, we're new, so we'll get better. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so does the user get a notification that there's a new message somehow so they can just open it in order to hear it? The user does, yeah. They'll get a notification as long as they turn notifications on. And uh, just to be clear and transparent, notifications are never sent for like marketing or uh, advertising purposes. They're only sent to share new content available on the app. I'm really interested in this because um, I have a friend who lost her husband a few years ago, but she told me that the mornings were the most difficult time for her because she had to, had to face an entire day of grief mm -hmm. and that just getting out of bed and getting going in the morning was the hardest thing. And so oftentimes that's when she would call me and just say, can we talk for a few minutes? I just need something. I need some support. I need something that can help me actually get going and get my day started. And so it seems to me like there's like lots of people have that need for, for something and just the support that it would offer and the messages it would bring to them, it seems would be really helpful. Thank you. Yes, that is the intention. Is there, um, we, we didn't talk about this before, but is there, could you read to us just a little bit of one of those? Like what, just to give us an idea of what the content might be, is that possible? Okay, so one is one musing that was sent out maybe about a month ago is called Listeners. And each of these, these daily refuge musings are narrated by yours truly. And hopefully I'll have the opportunity to, to share a little bit about um, why I voice narrate them myself. But this is called Listeners, and it goes like this. Years ago, the school I attended had a program titled Spiritual Direction. The skills taught were of discernment, 
contemplation, and companioning. But the most important skill taught in the program was that of deep listening. Deep listening in itself creates a container that holds space for thoughts and feelings to move from inward to outward. Deep listening allows for a feeling of sacredness to have significance in your life. Deep listening makes expressing grief feel safe, no matter how disjointed, scary, or graphic the experience may be. But deep, with deep listening, you feel heard and understood. When you have a deep listener to hold that space for your grief, it feels like you're experiencing healing. What you say or do is witnessed and honored for exactly what it is. Your grief isn't labeled, boxed up, dismissed, challenged, or time-stamped. It's welcomed and accepted for its real and authentic ways. Without deep listening, your grief can be shut down. If you try to tell your story, but you're offered a tissue, or the space is filled too quickly by well wishes of advice meant more for who it's actually coming from, where do you think your grief goes? It may well up inside of you where for you, it feels safe. Yes, it's protected, but it may fester and begin to boil, which could create heartache, hurt, or even not feeling accepted for how you feel. Deep listeners will honor that your death story must be told and retold that tears need to be shed in order to make room for your life story to reemerge and for love to fill in the gaps. Deep listeners help to create the container for your grief and your healing. Mm, that's really beautiful. Thanks for reading that just to give us a sense of the flavor of these, um, of these daily messages. Mm -hmm. And I, I can see why uh, that's very healing. But go ahead and, and tell us why you wanted to record them yourself. <laughs> okay, so this is a little bit of uh, synchronicity, we'll call it. I was at a training. I'm, I'm a grief companion. I've, I've studied with um, the Center for Loss and Life Transition. And... I have gone to these weekly seminars to advance my skills as a companion, to be a good listener, et cetera. And in July of 2020, um, I guess a year before the app was created, I was at a training. I gave a presentation at the training. And then afterwards, three different people approached me and they said, my goodness, your voice is so soothing. You should be on the Calm app. And for those of us that don't know, the Calm app is a meditation app. And it's um, it's very popular. I think there's over 150 million users of it. And I said, that's so interesting. I should, I should follow up on that. And I am a man of action. So I did uh, reach out to Calm. And to my surprise, they responded. And so there was some communication going back and forth. And Calm has a specific marketing strategy. They partner with celebrities or they partner with authors of books that have sold millions of copies. <laughs> and um, I'm not one of those people. <laughs> and so uh, they entertained my idea for a while, but then it just kind of fizzled. And so I was later, you know, after this all went down, I was on a hike with my wife and her best friend and I was sharing this story and a Jennifer, the best friend says, you know what, Reed, perhaps you could do better. And I was like, well, what do you mean? And she's like, why don't you create your own app? <laughs> and so mm -hmm. at the time it wasn't even a thought. And, um, and then I was like, Hmm, maybe I should, you know, maybe I should look into that a little bit. And Karen, what was interesting was at the time that I started doing my research for providing a grief support app, I looked at what apps were available on, on the app store for grief support. 
and almost like 90% or more of the apps that were in this category, they're all focused on what we call social networking. They were wanting to match someone who had a certain type of loss to another person who had type of loss. And I thought, well, that's great, but where's, you know, where's the grief support for the individual? Mm-hmm. Not, not all, not all grief support has to be peer to peer or, you know, um, peer to therapist or, you know, where, where's the internal process. And, and that's, you know, that, that's where I got started with coming up with ideas for grief refuge and then, you know, letting people test it and it coming to fruition. Hmm. Well, you're, it's very true. Your voice is very soothing and calming. And so uh, it's wonderful that it's, it's your voice that people get to listen to on the app. And you did, you mentioned um, being a grief companion. And I, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that, about what, what is a grief companion? And would you, would you tell us more about that? Yeah, happy to. I'm actually proud of this. I, uh, let's see. So I did study psychology and what was so interesting when I went to school was that I was at a small school and 90% of the population there, they were all developing skills and practice to be clinicians. They wanted to be therapists, particularly psychotherapists. And I was, uh, I was, you know, the minority that wasn't there to be a therapist. And so after experiencing a lot of my grief, you know, mentioning the story of losing Warren and also my dad, I realized, oh, I'm starting to feel like kind of this calling uh, to to provide grief support. And so I, I told myself, though, I said, well, in order in order to be good support to anyone else, I have to gain some skills. I have to do some training. And so I was looking for training that wasn't related to therapy because I knew I wasn't going to go back to school and become a therapist. And so I had some conversations with the hospice that I connected with at the time of my grief and learned that as a volunteer, I could really only do administrative work. And I was like, um, yeah, no. So Long story short, I I find the Center for Loss and Life Transition and Dr. Ellen Wolfelt, uh, who's an author of like 80 books related to grief and mourning. Um, He provides these trainings and you get a certificate of completion and it's, um, um, I'm forgetting exactly what it is, but it's like death and grief education. And I said, oh, this is interesting. You know, I'm going to look into this. Well, I went to my first training and I was like, this is it. You know, this, this is the type of language that I see so valuable in offering support to grievers. And it's, it's based on this philosophy that Ellen Wolfelt created, which is called the companioning philosophy. And so how I would define that is I, it's a little bit ironic me saying this now, because I feel like I've been talking too much, Karen, <laughs> is that a companion there, this is, this is my take on it. They, shut their mouth, they open their ears, they open their heart, and they keep soft eyes, and they resonate with compassion and empathy for the person that they're supporting. So in a nutshell, that's the companioning philosophy from my perspective. Mm, And so it's being the deep listener that you described in your um, the daily ritual message that you read to us. Yes, yes, it is. And I can say that of all the things I did to to try to get help with my grief, that really one of the most helpful things was just having someone who would be with me and, and sit with me and not feel like they had to say anything or had to try to make me feel better, just someone that could be there. So I really resonate with that idea of a grief companion. That's great. Yes. It's um, one last thing I'll say about the companioning philosophy is that a a lot of times um, now I'm I'm not trying to 
uh, talk bad or dismiss uh, grief related therapy. But a lot of times I hear people speak, uh, grievers speak to feeling like their grief is uh, deeply judged. And as a companion, judgment gets thrown out the door. And I'll give a perfect example of this. Um, I do maintain a small companioning practice. And a man that I've been supporting for six months now, um, he contacted me five, five weeks after his husband died of cancer. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it's been very painful for him. But all of a sudden, something changed after months. And uh, he was now in a new relationship. And he was telling me that a lot of his peers, like friends in his network, were saying, hey, you should probably slow down, buddy. Like, this is way too soon. And that contributed to a lot of his pain. He felt deeply judged for now getting involved in a new relationship. And so, you know, if I had personal beliefs about the timing of him getting involved in a new relationship as a companion, they get thrown out the door because it's all about compassion and empathy and supporting the person who has their process going on. Hmm. I really like that idea because that's, it's interesting. I was just, I was meeting with a little support group of uh, elderly people, each of whom had lost a spouse. And um, they talked about how much judgment they were receiving from the people around them. Most of the time, because they were taking too long to grieve, people couldn't understand why they weren't over it yet. But it's interesting there's judgment no matter what you do. Oh, you're already, you're already seeing someone else. It's too soon. Or, you know, and that, that kind of judgment about a unique individual process is just not helpful. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of judgment um, going around and a lot of it is unintentional, but I'll, I'll say, you know, as a griever, more common than not, yes, I'm stereotyping and generalizing. I apologize for that but I kind of feel like I have to, to make this point is that in the grief process, your sensitivity is heightened. And so when someone says something that is judgmental, they may think it's more just kind of surface level, but it can feel so hurtful and it can feel so painful to someone in grief. Hmm. Yes, exactly. And I, and I guess other people, like you said, they may be well-intentioned, but they don't they don't realize how their words are landing, mm -hmm. which is why, well, it occurs to me that the daily or the grief refuge app is kind of a companion, <laughs> kind of a good companion where there's no judgment there. Um, there's, you, know, you can write whatever you need to write. You can listen. You can even record your own story. <laughs> it's, it sounds like. And so, mm -hmm. I don't know. Would you say that it's, it's like a substitute, I guess, for a human companion. Yeah, it, it is the, it's the daily companion for your grief journey that is basically conveniently accessible. Yeah. Whenever you need it, even if it's two in the morning or, you know, it's always there for you. Yeah. Well, gosh, our time is flying by. There are so many other things I wanted to ask you just um, in general, but I wanted to just make one note that I feel like there are lots of possibilities for technology to help us that, you know, I mean, something like this app wasn't even available, of course, when I was grieving over my dad's death, but and even over my mother's death, which is more recent. And so... Um, I'm sure, I mean, you, of course, have to see possibilities for technology and how it can be helpful to us. And um, I feel excited for the future that there there may be other ways that, that we will find that the technology can make a difference in our lives. And so I just wondered what you what you think about that and how, how technology can benefit people. I guess, you know, here's one thought that I'm thinking of right now is that a lot of um, a lot of grievers may kind of say to themselves, "I'm not 
tech savvy. And therefore, you know, I can't use something like an app like Grief Refuge. Well, what's interesting is, and then the stereotype holds true that the younger generations are more tax, tech savvy. They have grown up on screens, et cetera. And they just get how to navigate things um, more intuitively. Well, here's, here's a gap that can be bridged between like connection between, um, you know, uh, let's say a grandparent with their grandchild, like the grand, they could ask their grandchild to help them navigate the use or even downloading uh, a piece of technology. I've, I've actually seen it with my mother, you know, um, a lot of her and my connection after my stepfather died was me helping her utilize modern technology. And so she appreciated my patience and she appreciated that I didn't judge her. And, um, and at the same time, here she was learning technology to help navigate her process. She learned, you know, she learned to look up podcasts to find and listen to, and she developed uh, the skills to text back and forth. So now she could communicate more frequently with her children and her grandchildren and she didn't feel as alone. So that's just kind of like, as far as a personal experience, that, that's what comes to mind. I think that also, Karen, I, regarding technology a little bit more broadly, um, it's just gonna get more common. So part of my reasoning in creating an app for grief support, because truthfully, I didn't think this was obtainable when I started researching this, I thought, hmm, this is, am I trying to make the impossible possible here? But um, I think technology is gonna, is gonna continue to be more and more utilized. It's, we're, we've learned through the pandemic that there is accessibility, we can get objectives met, we can get outcomes met um, while still doing things virtually. And so it's, it's changing our culture, um, it's changing the world, uh, and that can be perceived as a scary thing, but it also can be perceived as a great opportunity. It's just a matter of what kind of choices we want to make. And I really think one of the, one of the greatest gifts we could give to our older loved ones would be to help them help them learn how to use a smartphone and how to use just a couple of apps on the phone because uh really uh grief refuge is it's simple it's very simple to use mm -hmm. and if we were to just teach them how to use it and as you said a few things like texting um even looking at photos on the phone i just think of we we talk about this uh, crisis of loneliness amongst seniors but imagine how connected they could feel to their loved ones if they had a smartphone and they could send text messages and get emails and people could send them photos that they could look at um i think we would make a big difference for for those older people and and maybe we make a mistake if we assume they couldn't master the technology it's it's not that challenging if we take our time and show them how to use it yeah one of my companioning clients, um, she teaches me about Zoom technology all the time. I, I love it. And she's, you know, she's 30. Well, no, she would get upset if I said that. She's 26 years <laughs> my senior. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, you know, so it's, it's I, I share that in, in, in response to, it's, it's always possible, you know, it, you know, trying something new, you can realize, oh, this is really fun. I like this. <laughs> well, and I also wanted to mention besides the app, there is the website as well, griefrefuge.com. And you have um, articles posted there that you can, people can listen to the podcast on the website and then also uh, the potential for workshops um, and support groups through the website. So there's even more available uh, if, if for people who maybe don't want the app, but could go on the website as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunities to get great grief support. That's really, you know, our bottom line is to make sure that 
people are being cared for. Well, Reed, I'm so impressed with what you've created here. I think it's really novel and a game changer, in my opinion, for grief and how we approach grief in the future. And I know you'll keep adapting and probably, you know, adding to it and changing things as you go over time. And it, and uh, there's just so much potential here. And I'm, I'm very impressed that you had the inspiration and then the will to, to create it. Well, thank you, Karen. I appreciate your inquisitive questions. I, I really enjoy the way your mind works. And also, I have deeply enjoyed our conversation today. Well, same here. And so I'll remind our listeners to be sure to check out the website first, griefrefuge.com, but um, download the app, even if uh, you're not you know, actively grieving right now, because you need to see how beautiful it is. It's really the, um, has beautiful color photos on it. And it's, it's the design is, is really wonderful. It's very pleasing and appealing to use. So download the app and have it on your phone and, and who knows, you might be, um, inspired to use some of it. Even if you're, even if you're not actively grieving, you may want to do some journaling there and, uh, look at some of the other features. So Reed, thank you for joining me today. And, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how your app grows and whatever else you create in the future. Thank you, Karen. It's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Reed Peterson about the Grief Refuge app. And I am genuinely excited about this app. And I say that partly, I guess, as a person myself, I'm an introvert and I tend to do my processing and work on myself alone in private. I don't really care to be part of groups. I also have not resonated that well with therapy, even one-on-one -on -one therapy situations. Not that that's not great, and I'm a huge advocate of that for anyone else for, for whom it's helpful. Just for me, those aren't the settings in which I tend to learn the most or grow the most much of the time. So an app that I can use in private by myself in the middle of the night whenever I need it, uh, that seems really helpful to me because it gives me the private privacy that I need, the solitude, and um, the time for contemplation and to just go within myself. And I really am sincere about this. I love the features of the app, and it's been very thoughtfully put together. So it's free to download. So I encourage you to just check it out, because something might happen to you, like just happened to me with a friend that I hadn't seen for a while. We went out for coffee, and I ended up telling her about the Grief Refuge app. She downloaded it on her phone immediately, then called me later and said, I had no idea how much I needed this information. Uh, it reminded me that I still have so much work to do about the deaths of my parents, and I hadn't really thought that much about how much grief I'm still carrying, and this app is perfect for me. So, um, so I think it's the right thing for some people, probably not for everyone, but consider it. You can download it for free. And then maybe you'll be in a situation where you end up showing it to someone else and encouraging them to download it if it's the right thing for them. So I'll just remind you that I'll be here next week with another interview for you. Every Monday, I show up with something new going on. So if you like this content, be sure to share it with other people. You can tell them about the podcast. You can forward individual episodes to people that you think might be beneficial to them. And it's also really helpful if you subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you happen to listen, whether it's Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, some of the other podcast platforms out there, wherever you're listening, if you subscribe and then leave a review and a rating, that helps immensely to bring the podcast up in the rankings to make sure other people can find it when they're looking for content like this. So thank you so much to all of you out there who have left reviews in the past. I really appreciate it. So until we're together next week, remember that we're here for love. That's the thing that matters more than anything else in this life. So face your fear, 
be ready for whatever happens next and love each and every moment of your very precious life. Bye-bye.